Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the Central Bank of Chile for inviting me to this wonderful country. My name is Hock Lai. I'm the president of the Singapore FinTech Association. But uh, my day job, the job that pays the bills, I'm the head of digital office in NTUC Income, which is an insurance cooperative. In the NTUC Income, I focus on applying emerging technology to improve the delivery of our insurance products and services. I would like to give a quick introduction about Singapore FinTech Association because it is a very young association, about uh, one year and two months old. It was set up to facilitate the growth of the FinTech sector in Singapore and to allow the market participants in the ecosystem to collaborate with one another. We have about 230 corporate members. 80% of our members are FinTech companies and the remaining 20% are the banks insurance companies, consultancies like Deloitte, Ernst & Young, KPMG, and quite a number of uh, law firms. We have uh, three remits. One, provide uh, access to talent, fintech talent. Two, provide access to capital. And three, provide access to market access. All three objectives is for us to create a better paying job for residents of Singapore. Okay, today I'm going to cover the topic on fintech and the evolution of uh, finance. I will cover a brief introduction about what is fintech and then I will then articulate what are the key driving forces of fintech and then how the financial institutions are responding. Next, I will cover on fintech adoption worldwide before I conclude the session. Banks and insurance companies Traditionally, they rely on the vertically integrated uh, business strategy, whereby they control the three layers of production, distribution, and customers. And banks and insurance companies used to be highly profitable because it is very difficult to get uh, a banking license because of the high capital requirements. And a lot of them build their competitive advantage on a large network of uh, physical branches. And also, the IT cost in the typical bank is very high. Some estimate to be two-thirds of the startup cost. And more importantly, there is very low customer switch for banks. As a result, annual, annual global bank ROE averaged about 16% between the year 1980 to the year 2006. <coughs> However, since uh, 2007, and also catalyzed by the global financial crisis, the world of banking is never the same. Banks used to talk about having this uh, universal banking model whereby they are a one-stop shop, whereby you have your loans, you have your payments, you have your insurance. But since the emergence of uh, fintech, all of their current uh, business models are being attacked by the different fintech startups. This is the, a picture of the UBS trading room for equity trading. In the year 2008, there were about 600 traders. But in year 2016, there are only a handful left because most of the equity trading already automated using algorithmic trading. And UBS now employs about 200 computer engineers to do all this training trading and they don't have to be seated at the trading floor. So in a way, Wall Street has already been disrupted, especially in the, part, in the space of uh, equity trading. So what is FinTech? We define FinTech as the innovative use of technology and or business model to improve or transform the delivery of financial services and products to both consumers and businesses. So what is innovation? So innovation is something new that creates value. So from the banking sector, innovation is the something is about using technology, using business model, and which is new to the financial industry, and then that creates value, providing something that is cheaper, better, and faster. So the emergence of uh, new technology and business models enable innovation and ultimately disruption. 
The disruption in the banking ecosystem cut across all sub-sectors in banking from transaction, lending, deposit gathering, advisory, and also in the other industries. Let's talk about uh, Alibaba. Today, a user, a customer of Alibaba can handle all his daily needs from morning to night, from taking his cab, buying his lunch, booking a doctor's appointment, going for a movie ticket. Everything can be done in a simple mobile app. This is a typical example of a chorus bond bond banking, which is very inefficient because many parties are involved throughout the whole workflow, from the buyer's bank, the buyer's correspondent bank, to the <coughs> recipient uh, correspondent bank and supplier's bank. Throughout the whole process, different parties will collect different fees. So in the end, the whole process is expensive and slow. However, if you look at uh, how correspondent bank can be this intermediate, at the very high, highest level, by through the use of uh, blockchain technology such as Bitcoin, buyer and seller can connect directly and can achieve the usual transaction at typically one third the rate and one third the speed. So, what are the driving forces of fintech? I will talk about four key driving forces. First is on new technology. Second is on changing customer preference. Third is on new competitors. And lastly, on new regulation. New technology. Today, we have smartphones that are more powerful than the computers used to send men to moon in 1969. A lot of uh, fintech users now conduct all their banking through their mobile phone alone. And then we have technologies like uh, big data and machine learning. Today, uh, more and more data are being generated through, and a lot of these data are unstructured data through their interaction with social media and other kind of use cases. For example, today, a company called Lando, they can use your social media data and determine what is your credit risk because they realize that uh, customers of good credit risk tend to cluster together. So many, many fintech companies are using all this big data and machine learning to improve their service offering. Next is on cloud computing. Previously, it is very expensive to provision uh, banking services. But with cloud computing, storage and computing power are now provided at a low cost. This allows new entrants to come in and able to achieve profitability at low cost. And the thing is on blockchain, whereby common, a lot of statistics shows that 80% of banks are already experimenting with blockchain. Although we hardly see, you, we hardly see real life uh, use cases of blockchain. But the properties of blockchain, whereby transactions are secure, transparent, authentic, provides many benefits, especially in the parts of, like, for example, post trade settlement and payment. Last, last but not least, Internet of Things. Today, more and more smart devices are being deployed. These, de these devices have computing and connectivity functionality. For example, some insurance companies, they use a dongle and plug into the car, and they are able to analyze how your driving ha habit, how hard you are braking, how hard are you turning. And from there, they compute a risk score and then using it to determine your insurance <coughs> premium. Next, I want to touch on is changing customer expectation. Although these data are from America, but I think uh, largely it reflects a worldwide phenomenon whereby, for example, in America, the millennials, people who are born after 1980, they are the biggest cohort even higher than the baby boomers. And many expect that by the year 2020, half of them will be in the working force and they control almost half of the income. The millennials, 
up to 90% of them use smartphone and they prefer to use electronic devices to communicate to one another. Working in the insurance company, frequently we receive feedback from our young customers. They don't want to see insurance agent. They want to be able to complete their transactions through the use of a smartphone. How many of you enjoy your banking experience? <laughs> this statistic shows that for millennials, they rather visit a dentist than talk to a banker. <laughs> and many of them are, will not hesitate to switch to a different banking service provider. And many of them are open to banking services that will help them to analyze their spending habit and propose better financial planning solutions to them. So they have this kind of attributes. They expect things to be intuitive, smooth, highly personalizable. And these are the implications for traditional uh, the incumbents because they will have to respond to all these millennials since that they are going to be their key customers of the future. Next, I want to talk about competitors. Traditionally, banks compete with your peers. But now, banks have to compete with fintechs. And not only fintechs, but also techfin, technology company that are providing financial services. So to the, in the likes of uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and in China, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. Let's talk about the fintech. As you can see, the investment in fintech has increased exponentially from 4 billion in 2012 to 25 billion in 2016. With a huge war chest, fintech companies are able to acquire customers even at the loss because by acquiring more customers, they collect more data and they are able to adopt data-driven strategies. And these are some of the common uh, business models employed by fintech companies. First, they revolutionize the economics of the market. For example, by offering a previously paid service free. Exam one example is Simple Bank, whereby there's no requirement for minimum balances and there's no money fees. Or they will offer a significantly cheaper services, such as lending club. They are able to do credit assessment for unsecured personal loans. And they are doing it so well that a lot of banks are outsourcing credit assessment of uh, unsecured personal loans to them. Next, they create something that's new and compelling, such as providing a new type of service. One example is Trove that provides uh, on-demand insurance. For example, if you have an expensive DSLR camera, but uh, you want to buy insurance on it, with Trove, you don't have to buy insurance and protect it for 365 days because you only need to insure for it when you bring it up. So with Trove, you are able to insure it, let's say, for the next two days because you are going for a hiking trip. trip. Last is to distribute across an existing customer base. So one way is to solve the problem for another business. For example, there's this uh, Singapore ro robo-advisory company called Bamboo. They provide back B2B uh, robo-advisory platforms to other banks. Because a lot of banks, they might not have the expertise in building a robo-advisory platform, but through Bamboo, they are able to acquire this platform and service their existing customer base. The other way is for them to collaborate with Businesses. One example is the bank in Singapore, DBF Bank. They collaborate with another crowdfunding startup called Funding Societies. Because for many of the SMEs, they might not have a rich credit history, and this to the bank is a risky customer. So they will refer the, the SME to this crowdfunding startup called Funding Society. And over time, as some of these SMEs, they grow and, and they outgrew the, the ability of the startup to provide funding to them. And because they are able to show that they have very good credit history, they can then refer these customers back to the bank. 
one more thing I want to talk about is trust. Today, especially because of the global financial crisis, a lot of people don't trust the banks as well as the tech team company. As you can see, from Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, the trust level are low, below 50%. People trust PayPal, Amazon, Google and Apple more than the banks. Next, I want to touch on is regulation. Before the financial crisis, we go through an era of deregulation. Because of this, banks get, got uh, greedy and become aggressive in some of their business practices. This led to the global financial crisis in 2008. And because of that, banking regulation got tightened. We have Basel III that uh, increased your capital and liquidity requirement. You have other compliance uh, rules like CRS, FECCA. And the other thing is a lot of uh, governments start to adopt fintech friendly policies. One example is in uh, Europe, the PS2, PSD2 directive, whereby the banks are mandated to open up their customer accounts for other fintechs to use through the use of open API platform. So what are the responses from the financial institution? The opportunities and threat for responding or not responding is very high, according to a study by McKinsey. By responding to the competition for fintech, you are able to deliver 45% higher returns, mainly from lower operational costs through automation. But if you don't respond, up to 35% of your profit will be at risk, mainly through margin compression or because of a better value proposition from the fintech companies. These are the different ways traditional banks and insurers can respond. They can create their own standalone outfit to provide uh, fintech services, or they can partner, or they can lobby the regulators so that it becomes more difficult for new entrants to come in, or they can provide a better value proposition. So I will go through a few examples. For example, Goldman Sachs, they launched a direct online only personal loan service called Marcus. So this is a service that is similar to other fintech offering whereby there's no origination or prepayment fees. And they have been hugely successful in capturing a lot of the market share. They can also use the new technology to transform customer experience. For example, insurance companies, they are using Facebook messengers to allow you to purchase your travel insurance or banks using chatbot to allow customers to inquire about uh, mortgage loans and then after that complete some of the transactions online. Or they can transform operation processes through the use of artificial intelligence. For example, a Japanese insurance company, they are using AI to automate the assessment of health insurance claims. And through this, they are able to reduce the claim excesses by one third. I would like to cover on the part of collaboration because this is also one of the very viable models for financial institutions to compete by collaborating. Because we know the incumbents, they have disadvantages. They, they, they have legacy IT. They are not able to respond fast to the requirements of the millennials. They have, to stick, they have high regulatory and compliance requirements. And they don't have a mindset to, to be agile, to be flexible, to move fast. But for the fintechs, they have, most of them, they have low capital. They don't have an existing customer base. And in many countries, they don't have the trust level. But by combining the advantages of both these entities, they are able to uh, present better value proposition. So just now I talked about the lending, uh, uh, the crowdfunding company and the bank, how they collaborate and benefit one another. So next, I'm going to cut, touch on the global fintech adoption trend. This is a survey done by Ernst & Young. 
for the year 2017. They surveyed 22,000 uh, respondents and they defined a fintech user to be someone who used more than one uh, fintech service in the last six months. These are some of the findings. One, 33, that 33% 33 is The current adoption level is 33%, and this is a huge jump from 16% in the year 2015. Second is that uh, <laughs> second is that the average uh, adoption rate is actually high, higher in the emerging countries like China, Brazil. India. Next is the dominant uh, fintech services is actually payments and more users are expected to use it. Fourth, fintech users prefer to use digital channels to complete their transactions and last but not least, 13% of customers are super users of fintech services whereby they use five or more fintech solutions. This is a snapshot of the adoption level by countries. So we can see China, 70% of the users in China are very comfortable in using uh, fintech services, followed by India, UK, Brazil, and Australia. Next uh, finding is that fintech has actually achieved initial mass adoption in most markets. And also the adoption has increased. The grey colour refers to the adoption level in 2015 and the yellow colour refers to the adoption level in 2017 as you can see, especially in countries like UK, US and Australia. The adoption level has increased significantly. <coughs> and also the level of awareness of fintech has improved. Previously in 2015, only about 16% of the users are aware of fintech uh, solutions. But in year, the year 2017, it almost it more than doubled to 38%. And the most uh, common uh, fintech solutions are actually payments, savings and investment, and uh, more recently, insurance. And unsurprisingly, China leads in the adoption of fintech almost in almost all categories. And not surprisingly, the young adults, the millennials, they are the most conversant in using uh, fintech solution. And uh, on the other hand, looking at uh, the older users, they are more resistant to switch to use fintech solutions. And then what interestingly, although users and not and non-fintech users they share similar views according, I mean, on the personal risk in using uh, online services, but the behavior is very different. Although they know there are risks in using online uh, financial services, but fintech use, users still prefer the digital channel and then they 54% of them prefer to use a smartphone to complete all their transactions and they are willing to go for the products or services that give them the better quality over cost and for typically a fintech users will also be comfortable in using other kind of online services such as using a Uber cab or other on-demand uh, services such as using Netflix or Spotify. And more importantly, the consumer sentiment towards fintech is increasing. So the dark grey bar shows the fintech uh, in future what is the likely adoption rate as you can see, almost across all countries, 
the adoption rate will increase further. And again, borrowing and financial planning represent the largest uh, difference between the current and anticipated usage. And we, are ex we expect that uh, the current uh, adoption level, the average adoption from, will increase from 33% to 52%, equally contributed by current users of uh, fintech who only use one fintech services and those who don't use. And for the fintech super users, users who use 10 and above fintech solutions, you can see that they value uh, better quality services and the ability to assess different products and services more than, than the less uh, intensive users of fintech. So the summary on adoption is that fintech has achieved initial mass adoption in most markets. New services and new players are driving higher adoption. Fintech users prefer to use digital channels and technology to manage their financial life. And fintech adoption will continue to gain momentum in the future. To conclude, we can see that actually fintech is transforming uh, finance. Today, the way we do our banking, insurance, payments, lending will be very different. And innovation has to be the new competitive advantage of many of the financial institutions. And we can also see that there are evidence that a lot of incumbents are en embracing innovation as a new, new strategy. And fintech adoption will continue to grow in the future. Thank you.